on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. What have you done in building your businesses? And maybe it's marketing related, maybe it's not. What's just been a really solid decision that you can look back on and go, okay, when I did this, and yeah. maybe you've repeated it in your second and even now third agency, maybe we could share it and the listeners could implement it in their business. Yeah, there's no question. This is an easy, easy answer and probably the most valuable information I'll give on this podcast. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. I'm back with you today. Another king here on the stage. My good friend, actually, Buck Wise, my friend. Dude, thank Kings you stage. for having me on. I mean, I've been waiting for an invite to this podcast <laughs> for years now. And years. It's finally yeah. happened. This, you know what? I got the right here. I've got my list of goals, right? Yeah. <laughs> Get on your podcast. That was it. So, you know, you've always had a knack for inspirational words. And so I'm going to receive those as, as just that. I appreciate that. But in all seriousness, yes. Buck and I met a couple of years ago, several years ago, I guess now. We were just talking about how several years have already passed. It's been a few. And, yeah, it's been a few. But we met in a unique circumstance. I'm sure we can talk about that here in a little bit. But we met in the pressures of the 10X world That's and, right. and all of the things that were, we were building at that time. And we didn't get a whole lot of time to, to rub shoulders. But I've just always so appreciated just your perspective and your ability to articulate. And so I'm super excited for this conversation. Tell cool. us what kind of business that you have now. Yeah, sure. I run a full service marketing agency helping businesses doing over a million dollars in any vertical get clarity, get more organized, but more importantly, drive better results. And that's what our clients come to us for. I also work very closely with a lot of high end, high performing executives that are looking to build better personal brand. And that yeah. comes from 25 years of experience working across small business, big business, working directly with big entrepreneurs, lots of web celebs, people who are somewhere in the middle. You know, they, they don't quite have a business, but they have a personal brand and they're looking how to branch that personal brand into more business. Yeah. And so it really runs the gamut. But, you know, we're in our second year of this agency and I've got a, an amazing team and that team just crushes it every single day. This will be my third agency, if you can believe it or not. I have built and sold two other agencies. And so this is going to be round three. And you know what they yeah. say, the third time's the best time, man. I love it. I was going to make sure that the audience knew that, that you didn't just happen to become an, a marketing expert a couple of years ago. <laughs> and obviously your third one in 25 years of experience. And, and that's really some of the conversations that you and I were able to have even in person at the 10X headquarters was really about the marketing angle and the story. And, and that's even played into some of the personal brand stuff that you're doing. I want to yeah. definitely get to that because I think that there is an angle that you're obviously helping people with. We have a lot of business owners that listen to the show, but there's this creative space as well. So I see business owners that need the creative or, or personal platform or personal right. brand. And then there's a lot of personal brand or creators, as they call themselves, who don't have anything to sell. That's right. <laughs> there's a merging of this. And so maybe we can talk about that here soon. But I want to know, okay, third agency in, why? Why are you so like, into it when it comes to marketing, building businesses, building teams. You did the same thing for, for one of Grant's businesses. Like you're just like in it. What's the why? Like what's the burning inside of you for, for marketing? Sure. Yeah. I think the first thing is I'm just really fucking good at it. So like, why would you not <laughs> do it? You know? Yeah. It's like the simplicity, you know, you said it earlier. I hear people say this all the time. So it must be true in marketing. Perception is reality. Sure. Meaning if that's what people perceive, that's the reality of what you are. And so people always say, this is nothing I set out to do, but people always say to me, you have such an eloquent way to describe complex challenges in business yeah. marketing and sales. That's right. And so I, that's really what I feel like I do more than anything is I break down the smoke and mirrors of marketing for people and I, I help that. business owners get organized. And when I take that organization, I put systems in place for people where there is no failure. And if there is failure, you see it right away. You're able to optimize and create better, better results immediately. But yeah. I would say, you know, the second thing is I actually kind of fought it on this third round of agency building. Okay. You know, I, I built my first agency way back in Detroit, Michigan. I was working for CBS radio at the time. I had a morning show in Detroit and the Detroit Tigers came to me and they were like, Hey, how do we get you to do digital? Like you're doing digital for CBS. Yeah. And I said, I don't know, I guess I've never really thought of it. So I got permission from my market manager to start this agency. Yeah. And I started working, you know, my first client out of the shoot was Major League Baseball. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I was like, wow, I have no clue what I'm doing. I mean, I knew the digital side. I didn't know business, though. Right. So sure. I was trying to figure it out. 
But eventually I, I, you know, I built that agency up to, I think it was four or five employees, small agency. We were doing like two or 3 million a year. I had like 17 clients across the Midwest, very Midwest focused, but I sold that agency to a smaller agency and then worked my way up through that agency into bigger clients. And so I started working with Nike and Starbucks and, and so, you know, I've watched the agency space take a shift and they used to do a lot of acquisition through agencies. They used to got it pick up little ones and build big ones out of the little ones. They take 10 yep. little ones that are really good at one thing and make one big full service agency. They yep. don't really do that anymore. The agency space is just trying to keep the profit margins they have now. Agency, by the way, if you're watching this, you're like, Shit, I should start my own agency. Don't. I'm telling you right now, the margins <laughs> suck. Like agency is one of the hardest businesses to build. There are yep. a lot other, if you want to be a business owner, There are a lot of other better business models out there. But to answer your question, why would I do it this third time? Yeah. What I noticed is I'm really good at it and it becomes the connector to other opportunities for me. Yeah. The opportunity for me to create new businesses. So for example, in the last two years, two of my marketing clients, I came in to service just one aspect of four aspects of business. Right. And in that, I found an opportunity to build new p ls build yeah. new LLCs, new partnerships. And so I have two other companies that I created last year, but it was all through this vehicle. It was all yeah. through marketing. So I'm not looking yeah. to build the agency out to be a billion dollar global world dominating. I mean, listen, I'm worried sure. we got big goals and we definitely want yeah. revenue and profit and all of those things. But I have no exit strategy on the agency other than it connects me to better exit strategies, if that makes yeah. sense. Kind of yeah, meta. which, yeah, which it, it aligns with what you were just saying to people listening. Don't, don't start your own agency. <laughs> it's tough. Which is, it's really which is funny because that's how we met each other. I was, you know, building an agency for Grant and you came in as an expert in the, in the agency world and we talked a lot of the difficulties actually. 90% we of agencies fail and I'll tell you why. Talent. The margins are tight. So when the margins are tight, you pressurize the talent. That's right. And, and in any business. And, 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 and any business, but agencies are worse because they're creatively focused. Yeah. So the problem is 80% of an agency is a creative role. And in creative roles, it's really hard to pressure test creative because yeah. they're built different. I actually give kudos to what Grant was able to do. He was able to build yeah. a system where he's able to keep talent that wants to perform, learn, and grow. Yeah. And then it churns any bad talent, any, any creative talent that doesn't understand business, that doesn't have personal goals, it churns them out right. of the system really quickly. Yeah. So even though he's not technically an agency, he's got a lot of creative people working for him and a lot of them oh, yeah. stayed for a really long time. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we could, we could talk a whole another podcast on what he's built and the benefits of that machine for sure. I think the agency piece transitions to business because what you're saying is that really talent matters. And then depending upon what the offer is or what the service is, the margins, that those things can correlate whether to actually be able to go hire talent, but then whether the talent is squeezed. I think all of those things are relevant. Do you find that that thing exists in all of the clients that you're helping now as well? Does that marginalized compression happen you in know, these other it's businesses? Not, it's not as bad. Like I've got med spas that are clients, right? Their margins are right. freaking ridiculous. You know, these IVs <laughs> that people are getting? Are I really know, it's crazy. Happy. Dude, they're paying $8 for a bag. They're charging $250, $300. The margins are stupid. But in order for those companies to truly scale, it is always about talent. It's about inspiring people to come to you, attracting great, amazing talent. And then it's process behind that so that they're able to take positions and you're able to use process and scale you out of those roles so that you can build bigger portions of your business. So, I mean, talent is always kind of the hinge to some degree, but it's easy to keep talent when your margins are freaking great. You know what I mean? And the challenge in marketing, if you you are a marketer, you're in the marketing space, the challenge is there's, it's such a wide vertical. You got big agencies doing RFPs for million dollar campaigns, and you got a billion mom and pop businesses that are spending well, I run ads and I built a website and I spent three grand, you know, and then you're trying to charge eight grand, right? right. For, for, for services, you know, are quality, not some outsourced right. Fiverr bullet. It's some other basement dwelling agency, 
is yeah. running, right? How many agencies are run out of their mom's basement? A lot. Right. And you know what? They're so good at the actual branding that you have no idea. These guys don't have legitimate businesses. There's right. thousands. Of, so it's, it's getting difficult to differentiate yourself in a sea where, you know, there's the small agencies and then there's the massive corporate agencies. And I sit somewhere right in the middle where I can produce high-end corporate content, but we can also work with small mom and pop businesses and help them grow as well. But the problem is, is competitively, it's all education. The clients right. don't understand the difference. Well, why are they charging a grand to do the same thing you guys would charge eight grand for? So right. then the good agencies like us, we have to work a lot harder to prove through why you yeah. wouldn't want to go with these crap basement dwelling agencies. You know? Yeah. Which I think this topic, I, I want to just press on you a little bit because you're obviously very passionate about this. I think it matters to all businesses because, you know, whether a guy is listening right now who installs decks or a gal starting a retail flower shop or whatever. Right. Them differentiating themselves is obviously a part of marketing. This is what you help people do. It makes That's sense right. that you're passionate about it. And so how can the listener right now hear what you're saying and going, okay, um, I need to differentiate myself in a way that, you know, exudes value more so specifically that puts me over and above or shoulders ahead and above or head, whatever that phrase is yeah. to the person that's operating just out of their pickup truck or operating yeah. just out of their mom's basement. What have you done specifically to help overcome that, that they can maybe do in their businesses? Yeah. First of all, I'm going to give you a quick tip that will work okay. with any business that you're going to conduct. If you're a business owner and you're about to spend money on a vendor or a service, ask for proven case studies. Yeah. Okay. Ask for proven results. You want to see the proof. Ask for the revenue of the agency that you're going to work with and ask how they were able to create it. If they can't run a business themselves, then how are they going to run your business? That'd be my first piece of advice. But when sure. it comes to differentiating, to get very specific. There's two things that are really important. Every business owner, doesn't matter how small or big you are, that you must do first. Understand who you are and understand who your target is. Yeah. If you have those two things, and I mean detailed. I, I right. talked about this two days ago, if you saw my Instagram, which by the way, I'd, I'd love anybody watching this right now. If you want tips like this, Hit me on Instagram about Buck. I all day long I just do the value, value, value. There's no funnel. I'm not driving call to actions. I'm not trying to get you to sign up for my weekly newsletter. It's sure. all education and value. It's about Buck on Instagram. I talked about this two days ago. You you know, business owners think they know who they are. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Know who I am, know who they are. Got it. Yeah. I know my and they brand. move on. I know my target, but you yeah. don't. You don't know. And I'll pressure test you for 30 seconds and you won't have answers. I'm going to ask you very specific questions. I'm going to ask you why you exist for the consumer. And I'm right. talking internally, why do you exist for the consumer? How do you change their life in a non-transactional way? I'm going to ask you that same question. How are you different? And here's the best part. Can you give it to me in one sentence? Yeah. And when I ask your other employees, are they going to give me the, the same, same answer? sentence? Yeah. Because that's how you know when there's fragmentation issues, when yep. your corporation is not being run the way you think it's being run. And then I'm going to ask you, you know, from a core competitive standpoint, what are the attributes of your brand? And if you can't list those out, you haven't done due diligence. Also, I'm going to ask you to actually, you know what? I might ask you to email it to me. I'll ask you, even if you have it written down, send me your brand. Yeah. Send me your strategy. What does your brand stand for? What are the differentiators? What are your attributes? Show me. Yeah. If you can't show me, you don't have a strategy. You have an idea. You have, right. you're, you're still in concepting phase. Yeah, but Buck, we did $1.2 million last year. Congratulations. You accidentally yep. created a million dollar revenue. You'll yeah. never <laughs> go to 10. You'll never go to 20. Right. You'll yeah. never go to 50 with this, with the idea in your head. I think that's yeah. the thing that drives me the most crazy. I love the startups. The startups are great because they're like, what do I do? Right. But you get this. I, I need to come up with a term for them. They're like the edge of success. Yeah. They're like, you know, they're like, we just created enough momentum. And they're like, we made, they Change think a million dollars is a lot of money. They're like, oh, That's we right. made, and they're like, no, we know all that. We just need you to run ads. They get in this weird place where they quit thinking long-term because the money hits and it's like a yeah. junkie, like a drug. Yep. And then they just want more. They're just like, yeah, come on, man. We just, you know, I don't need all that strategy, the brand thing, the target. Like, we just, we just need you to like make a landing page and like 
increase yeah. the nurture on the email. Yep. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's, that's, we got to back up guys. We're going to go to 10 million. We're going to work on this for the next few years. Like right. we're not going to just run a Facebook ad tonight and blow this out of the water. This is not how yeah. it works. You know, who'll take that gig. I was going to say all the mama pop. <laughs> yeah, basement agencies. They'll, yeah. No. And they'll promise you, oh, we'll do, you know, we'll five exit. We'll 10 exit. Like, and then they don't. And then they come to me and then they have to pay more and they wasted their money, you yeah. know? So, yeah. well, it's a time horizon decision-making, right? You're talking about something that's substantial that can't happen in one Facebook ad or right. one funnel or no. one email sequence. Well, you yes, just, those are part of it. The key for me is I'm a data marketer. You know, people do, they give me the term, they'll say like marketing expert. I, I don't like that term. I have a lot of failure. You can call me that. I've done a lot of business. I've had a lot of failure so that I know what not to do again, but I am focused on data. And so data informs strategy, strategy informs creative. It's in that sequence that you create more success. Data, strategy, creative. Basement agencies, by the way, I'm picking on basement agencies. First of all, one, appreciate their hustle. The problem is those basement agencies fake it till they make it. And you will pay the price for them faking it with your dollars. Yeah. The same holds true. Let me switch gears. The same holds true when you're hiring marketers in your business. Yeah. Amateur associate marketers, people who have just started, yeah. will drain your ROI if they don't have the actual experience as well. Yeah. So you need to be, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to hire a, 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 an amateur marketer. What I'm saying is, have a lens on what they know versus what you know. Yeah. And what they need to do is mimic someone who's already created success. You bring in right. someone like me to put a blueprint together for yep. them to execute. They execute yep. against data, strategy, creative. So the first yeah. way to know if you're dealing with it, this is easy. So maybe you don't want to pressure test your new employee or a basement agency. You don't want to pressure test. Okay, great. Don't ask them for results. Don't ask them for cases. The price was so cheap, you just went for it, right? Okay, right. ready? If they come to you with creative ideas, here's what we're going to do. Tuesday's benchmark, live on Instagram. Thursday, carousels. Friday, we're going to do an email blast to this list, right? Creative, right. creative, creative. They're at the end of the sequence. Right. That's how you know if they're professional or not. A professional starts with, let's look at the data. What does the data say? Because the data doesn't lie. So that would be my best advice is always look for who's, look at this. When they start speaking, listen very carefully. Is it creative, 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 right? Or some, some marketers that have done it long enough are talking strategy, strategy, strategy. Right. Well, what we want to do, because we know this performs well on TikTok, is anything under 30 seconds Blah, 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 right? Strategy, strategy. So you're right. like, oh, they know strategy. Great. Ask them. So tell me, what's the data that you found for one, for us to be on TikTok, right? right. Yep. Well, two, what's the audience that you're trying to reach on TikTok? Three, how many of them should we expect on reach to actually see this? Four, from a data standpoint, what, what would be the average conversion rate of a target like this? Let's say older demographic on TikTok, because I don't know. Older yeah. demographic on TikTok. What's the average conversion rate of an older demographic? Do they have trust on that platform? Data, data, right. data. Ask data questions, yep. right? Because some people launch right into strategy with nothing to back it up. And usually what that person is doing is they're mimicking things they've seen other people do, yeah. which means it's not custom to you. It's yep. templated from some other client, some other campaign, and they're just going to plug you yep. into that campaign. So yeah. that would be my best advice. Long-winded answer. I hope that didn't no, go too long for you, but it's so deep and so so rich. I, I want to ask you, a, a, I guess, a question on a specific angle there. Yeah. On data, what yeah. I have found in dealing with customers of all different types of businesses is that if you have a data-driven person, just maybe more naturally or maybe based on their personality, mm -hmm. a lot of times a data-driven person wants not like proof, but yes, that's part of it, but like a guarantee or show me exactly this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And you and I both know in marketing that things are a little bit nuanced and a little bit flowy because it's your brand and it's not going to be the same cookie cutter to your point that you just made. Mm -hmm. So how do you go from being data driven? Because I'm yeah. so in alignment with you on that. 
yeah. to also understanding that this is a 10 year horizon that we're talking about going to 10 million or five year, whatever the big, and there's going to be like these bobs and weaves that we got to, we got to take and nuances through the process. Yep. yep. That's, that's a, that's a, maybe one of the best questions anybody has ever asked me. Really good question. You're throwing a dart and you're trying to hit the bullseye. The more data you have, the closer to the bullseye you're going to get, the more money you're going to save. But ultimately, the data is the Google map. So think of it that way. Yep. The data is the Google map. I have a Google map. You don't have a Google map. We're going to the same location. We understand exactly where the goal line is. Right. We both get in our cars. Who's going to get there first? Right. Yeah. You turned left. You should have turned right. Yep. I turned left at the same time as you. My map said, turn around. You should have gone right. Yeah. Data is the voice navigation of the map. Love it. So it, to your point, you're not always, you know, there's three things a business can do. Scale, sustain, or slip. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing else. Yeah. So the question is on your map today, this hour, this minute, here's your goal. Here's where you're at. Are you sustained? Are you going above the goal? Are you scaling past it? Right. Or are you slipping below it? The faster we know where we're going, the quicker we change choruses. That's right. So that's the point of data to me is that if you don't, and that's the point that's hard to get across to owners. Why? Right. Yeah. Because it's not tangible. Right. Because they're paying for something they can't physically hold in their hand. Yeah. But it's peace of mind to the owners that understand it. They sleep better because they know that if it doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, it is in a 24 hour period before they save the, the boat. They stop the hole. They, right. you know, they tourniquet the bleeding, you know? So like other businesses will go 30 days with a crappy agency and just bleed out for 30 days. Right. And, and so that's, to me, that's the importance of data is just knowing exactly where you're supposed to be. Anybody that tells you, any marketer, high level beginner says, this is exactly what we should do. It's guaranteed success. They're not yeah. a great marketer because that nobody's going to guarantee the strategy, but I'm going to guarantee I get closer yeah. than the competitive agencies. I guarantee I'm going to guarantee they probably closer. had some sales training. <laughs> That's <laughs> not right. so much. Maybe in marketing. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how does one know they're listening right now? They just launched a marketing campaign or maybe they're mm -hmm. considering working with you. They're considering working with any vendor, I guess, really, but marketing is the topic here. So I am going to make a decision. I'm going to spend X amount of money. Is there a time frame that I should hold on, but yet I don't want to bleed out? Like, I don't want to bleed out on a bad decision, yeah. but I also don't want to get out too soon to your point, because sometimes it's just a matter of letting the thing happen that needs to happen for a period of time. What is that period of time? So back to data, I always go back to data. What are the KPIs we're tracking? How much we're spending? Are we tracking the reach versus acquisition? Are we looking at MQLs, marketing qualified leads versus SQL, sales qualified right. leads? Yeah. Are we, so it depends on the campaign very specifically, sure. but it's those, it's those data points that tell the story. So then this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. And this is where experience comes in is data is only data. But to somebody that reads it, it's like Braille. If I handed you Braille right now, right. how easy would it be? Me and you, yep. neither one of us would probably do well, right? <laughs> right. right? But if you've read data for a really long time, you can tell the story, you paint the picture, right. you, color, you color in what happened. So, right. hey, huh, interesting. You got a lot of reach here, meaning it's hitting that target audience. They do exist, but you are getting absolutely no acquisition, no conversion, no signups, no new contacts created. Right. Tells me a few things. So now we have to dissect immediately yeah. it's not resonating are we fishing in the right pond right Do we have the wrong target no got the right target data says this is the target that likes this thing that wants this thing that needs this thing then guess what what's your call to action how creative is it is it trustworthy right. you know because ultimately you know talk about simplicity all marketers are really doing is trying to get the world to trust them that's it yeah yeah so so it ain't working somebody don't trust what you're doing Right. If you tell me, I know me, my value, why I'm different, and I know them, and that's them, and a marketer makes that connection and nothing happens, then you got to look at the creative. And you got to look at the creative and say, why is it not resonating? And 
usually it's because you don't know your target well enough. Interesting. If you, if you knew your target well, if you knew them intimately, yeah, you would have no problem getting them to go. That person speaks my language and that is exactly what I need. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really, you, you mentioned this a few minutes ago, how a lot of people skip over this or they've heard like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it before. Like know my avatar. Right. Yeah. But it really is important to your point. Like every little data point along the way, it kind of goes back to, okay, I can, I can analyze each point of conversion in a funnel or a sales process, mm -hmm. but really what I'm analyzing is who's on the other end and what's being delivered to them at what points. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. So Help us understand. You said you work with business owners that are doing a million or more in revenue in any industry. Who is that? How do you know them? Get, describe this person to us. The, the, the businesses that we work with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, kings and queens, Chaz Wolf. I want to talk to you about something that's super important to me. We put a lot of time and effort, we meaning myself and my team, into this podcast, into the content that goes out every single day. And if you have been getting any sort of value or insight from this, we want it to be able to reach other business owners too. So we would love if you would like, comment, share, leave a review, post, share again, <laughs> all of the things on social media, on all the different platforms, or even on the podcast mediums of Apple and Spotify. We would love to be able to get our content into more hands, more entrepreneurs, so they can grow their business as quick as possible. Together, we are building a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their businesses to new heights. So let's do this. Let's help each other. Let's help each other grow. Yeah. Just give us, like, yeah. I'm using this as an example to show the listener intimate things that you might know that they might get their brain thinking about things that they need to be knowing about. Sure. Their yeah, I could give you, let me give you two good, good examples. The first one is I actually studied the drinker of a pumpkin spice latte for six months. So <laughs> we had to know them very intimately. Howard Schultz came to us and said, hey, we've got a problem the market is saturated with pumpkin spice. Starbucks was the original pumpkin spice drinker, right? And, and McDonald's came out with pumpkin spice. Then Burger King came out with a pumpkin spice, right? And then Dunkin' Donuts competitively came out with a triple sugar pumpkin spice because they like sugar and all their stuff, right? And yeah. then Yankee Candle came out with pumpkin spice. Then Durex Condom came out with pumpkin spice, right? Like, you could pumpkin spice anything. anything. Yeah. We did the research, right? So we took four pieces of data. We looked at internal data. We looked at what they call POS point of sale data. We looked at loyalty data. If you guys, if you have that, what is it called on the wallet? Isn't that what they call it? Yeah. If you have this Starbucks card right here, that holds a lot. It holds geo data. It holds purchase data. So we looked at loyalty information and then we even looked at third-party data, we purchased third-party data from credit cards because we wanted to sure. learn more about the spending habits or behaviors of specific targets. And, and what we were able to do is take all this information and tell a really deep, rich story about this persona, this target. And yeah. so her name was Heather. We presented Heather to Howard Schultz. And, you know, she was millennial. And Heather had college debt. But she was a trendsetter in her micro group. She knew the trends. She just couldn't afford them. So like a nice pair of new Ugg boots, she got at the end of the season on layaway so that she could wear it the following season. Right. Uh, and, you know, we studied the things that Heather likes the most because what the reason we wanted to spearfish, I call it spearfishing versus wide net. The yeah. reason we wanted to spearfish Heather was because we knew she drove more occasions of sipping in the season. And mm -hmm. so she would have the biggest impact on revenue. Target me all day with pumpkin spice. I'm never going to buy one, right? It's a waste right. of ROI. Target Heather, she'll remember to buy an extra one at each week when she normally would have forgotten to buy one. So mm -hmm. top of mind awareness and attention. So we had to determine what data point did we learn about Heather that created the most success? And this yeah. was it. We learned that Heather hated being on the wrong side of FOMO, fear of mm -hmm. missing out. She wanted to be the one that said, first sip of the season, PSL, <laughs> right? She wanted to be <laughs> on her Instagram with her fingerless mittens in 70 degree weather with yep. a tree behind her, right? So we studied Heather and that FOMO That's data funny. point, what it taught us was if we dark posted and segmented only Heather 
and said, hey, nobody knows this exists. The drink isn't even out yet, but we're going to give you exclusive access to sip it first in the season before anyone else. And you can share with all of your friends that you know it exists. So we put a secret code in and we dark posted only Heather's and it drove a 20% increase in revenue from the year before, you know, but it was only because we spent six months and millions of dollars of research. Now I get it. Small businesses don't have six months and you don't have millions to research your consumer, but don't give me excuses. Don't give me that bull. Yeah. It's very easy to go backwards. So first step you can take, go back to your current target, your current persona. How many of you already have the current persona or target in your database? Should be everybody unless today's your first day. Go back and examine the ones that created the biggest impact on your business. I want you to have 20, 30 minute calls or coffees with this, with this persona. And I want you to ask them a series of 20 to 30 questions. Which questions? The one that, that are going to help you make better decisions on what you're doing for your own campaigns, for your That's own right. business campaigns. But what we're looking for is a trend line, okay? So we're looking for everyone answering the question. So the more you can interview, the better. If you can interview five, that's great. If you can interview 10, even better, right? That's great. What is the answer they all gave that you can emphatically say, we know the consumer feels this way because they all said it. That's a trend line. Right. We knew that Heather wanted to be the very first person in her circle, in her group to say she knew it existed. She bought it and she documented the process on social. She she wanted that clout in her inner circle. She didn't even want to be famous or an influencer. She didn't care. She wanted her friends to know she was the one that was up on the trend. Right. Mm -hmm. So that data point was worth a lot of dollars. My question to you, if you're a business owner. What data point, what question are you going to ask your consumer that's worth an extra 20% increase in your revenue? That would yeah. be my best advice if somebody's starting to target somebody, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Those are super great points. I love the story too. I think everybody can think about that Heather, if you will. And mm-hmm. really, if you just put any sort of effort towards, you know, whether you're looking at your current list of, of clients or, or not, and you just, you're just, thinking about who you would like to do business with. Think about what they do for fun and what they do for a work or do they not work? I, I remember doing this with, with Edible Arrangements. Obviously, you know, I have or had several, but have a few left still. But it's like, you know, Valentine's Day and, and Mother's Day are not my avatar, right? Those are the mm-hmm. huge times of the year for sure. But every other day of the week, it is not a dude coming in and buying something for his wife, mom, or sweetie. Right. Every other part of the year, it, it's someone completely opposite. And I know what she does for work. I know how old she is. I know that she's, you know, running the, the family calendar as far as gifts giving and, and all of that. Yep. And so I think that this is super powerful. What have you done in building your businesses? And maybe it's marketing related, maybe it's not. What's just been a really solid decision that you can look back on and go, okay, when I did this, and yeah. maybe you've repeated it in your second and even now third agency yeah. where you would maybe we could share it and the listeners could implement it in their business. Yeah, there's no question. This is an easy, easy answer and probably the most valuable information I'll give on this podcast. There's nothing more powerful than your personal brand. And if you aren't invested in your ability to be a thought leader in your industry, in your vertical, then you are missing an opportunity for rapid growth, rapid attraction of amazing talent and better connections to build bigger businesses. I can't tell you the amount of owners I meet that are afraid to put the camera in front of their face and start connecting online. Instead, they want to be behind the scenes, behind the curtain. And I'm not saying you can't create a successful business, but my question is how big do you want to get and how fast do you want to grow? Because in the first break point of business, before you hit 5 million in revenue or 10 million in revenue, it is you. They're buying you. They're not buying the product or service. They're buying trust from an individual. Right. Yep. When you get to Starbucks level, it doesn't have to be you, but even Starbucks, you know, Howard's an ambassador for Starbucks, right? right. Like, so you always should be an ambassador to your business. Doesn't mean that you have to be the, the lead gen, the sales, the closer. It doesn't mean right. you have to be all aspects of it. But the concept is this. If you create an amazing template of what an ambassador and a personal brand should look like, then your other leaders are going to follow in your footsteps and create the same level of commitment to the business that you are. And that's you passing the baton 
to right. your senior leaders. So you can go on sabbatical for four months and you have other great leaders and ambassadors that are driving connection in the business. That's so right. I think you're missing the boat if you say, oh, no, I got a flower shop. We do e-com. It's all Google reviews are great. Five stars out of five. Great. Awesome. No one knows that, you know, Heidi is the owner and Heidi's right. just amazing. And she gives back to the community. There's no story. Heidi doesn't exist. It's just you. You are yeah. just a transactional flower shop that's creating yep. marginal success. And, yeah. and if you want to get bigger, you got to start creating content and telling stories. It's just so much more rich. It's yep. easier to trust and you'll convert so much faster. The other thing is you may sell that flower business one day. And when yep. you, the one thing that they can't take when you go, when you sell that flower business yep. is your personal brand. That equity sticks with you no matter what you do or where you go. That's right. Yeah, I was just getting ready to ask you the parlay. Obviously, you have parlayed into multiple agencies, even working with some pretty big names. But that personal brand is something, it's not associated just to this one business, although it highlights this business. That's right. You can have multiple businesses, or maybe it's just a, a business after this one's sold and done and gone. That's right. uh, the value, I think, what you just shared, and, and help me articulate this further if, if we're not on the right point here, but is that even for the small person who is the small business owner, mm -hmm. um, creating the storyline about them personally is the differentiator in marketing today versus the transactional, maybe what we're used to from 30 to 50, 100 years ago. It's just, hey, here's my stuff. Here's how you buy it. And today, that's not how consumers operate. So even if it's home service or if it's marketing or if it's flowers, there's a way for you to be able to communicate as the entrepreneur a, a storyline yeah. about yourself that makes you real, authentic, relatable. A creator is probably what you're thinking of, but it makes it it makes it makes open or, or vulnerable enough or a storyline that someone else can follow. And then yep. when they're ready, they make a purchase from you, in that's essence. A hundred percent in the beginning. And I'll give you something to look forward to, ready? Because you're never going to get rid of problems. You're always going to look for bigger problems. So here's going to be your biggest challenge. If you build your business with your personal brand, it's a great way to kickstart engagement, trust, and conversion. Yeah. But you have to be careful. I have businesses that come to me at the five and 10 million mark, and the business only exists because of their personal brand. Mm, yeah, so that's good. The key is this is the big key. One, you have to do it. I'm going to make you do it. Number two, train other leaders, attract better talent, train them to do it as well, right? Yep. And then as you have one, two, three, four leaders, guess who's doing it less? You. Less of your personal brand, more of theirs. You can't right. sell a company with your name on it. It's really difficult to sell something that personal. So yeah. you got to be careful as you build the personal brand. You're an ambassador to the brand, creating a template for other right. leaders in your organization That's to good. learn how to do the same thing. That's exactly it. That's good, man. Let's talk about a bad decision, something that you've seen one client make or something that you've done in business that was just not great and we could stay away from. Yeah, I would say my career was very much built backwards. And so that is that learning lesson we talked about early on, which was I started with iHeartRadio on the TV and radio side. I was doing my own radio show syndicated to over 60 markets. I had a show with Ryan Seacrest in Los Angeles pre-idol, so nobody knew who he was. But we did a show together on iHeartRadio in LA for two years. And it was all creative. I learned some valuable lessons of how to build a community and how to engage and drive a very particular behavior. Sure. All good things. But I didn't understand the business side of strategy. I didn't understand yeah. the back end side of data. And so it wasn't until later till I started that little agency with the Tigers that I had to fake my understanding of business acumen, what a P&L is, how to do taxes, what right. margins look like, you know. And so I, I learned the hard way through that. I don't know that there is a school that really teaches you great marketing, great sales, great business, other than, you know, Carnot University, if you're looking for sales, is a great yeah. one. If you're yeah. in real estate, one of my clients, Ryan Serhant, has an amazing sales training program for yeah. real estate agents. And so, you know, there's, there's the, the, again, there's no university. There's just people who have done it before and they did it the yeah. hard way, right? That's they right. figured it out on their own. They all have amazing entrepreneur stories. But I would say the biggest challenge every business owner faces is one, not understanding the data, two, not investing strategically in the long term. Right. And then I would say the last and most important mistake that you can make. And not only have I done this, it's easy for every business owner and entrepreneur 
to ease back into this. You need people in your circle to remind you to pull out of this because it happens often. As entrepreneurs and especially marketers, it's very easy to go transactional right. and just go straight for the conversion yep. versus the nurture. So I'm going to give you a data point that's going to help you remember this. Okay. 70% of the success of any campaign you build should be the nurture, mm. not the awareness, attention, and flow to the conversion. Hey, 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 now buy, right? You skip right. the middle. 70% right in the middle. Here's the attract. Attraction is easy. Running ads is easy. YouTube right. is easy, right? Going live on Instagram, easy. Hey, attention, awareness, look at me, value propositions, right? Right. Okay, it looks interesting, right? Problem is our call to actions. Think of a first date. You know, you take a girl out on a date and you're just like, you want to you wanna hook up? And they're like, it's disgusting. I don't even know. You haven't even bought dinner yet, right? That's what right. marketers do. We're yeah. just like, hey, let me take you to date and pull your pants down. You know, it's like, you're I, disgusting, yeah. right? Like yeah. 70, like, dude, buy flowers, pull the seed out, tell them they're beautiful, listen to them, understand them, make them feel heard. Yeah. You well, won't man. ask for the conversion. They'll ask no. you. That's right. How do I buy? Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I built a... A platform that had some, you know, sales process training years and years ago. And this is an example that I gave even in sales, because it, it works the same, whether you're in the marketing part of the funnel or you're downwind in, in the sales process. I, the example of dating and everything that you just said is so, so spot on because this is how normal people in, even in the sales process operate. It's yeah. just pitch. Do you want to buy? And it's like, well, wait a second. Yeah. Can you wind me? Can you dine me? Can you get to know my name? And, and yeah. I, I give the example, like you said, of all the little things you do, you know, pulling out of the chair and the flowers and all the things. It's the nurture, and, yeah. Yeah. You lean in, you ask great questions and you get curious and like, maybe like you actually care about yeah. the other human on the other side of the table. And yeah. what that, what that tends to do at the end of it is in the example of the dating, she's calling her friends going, oh my gosh, he's so amazing. But the reality of it is, is that I rarely, I didn't even talk about myself. Yeah. She doesn't really know a whole lot about me because, yeah. because I was so curious in that scenario of the dating scenario. So true about her and trying to just like really pull out what's important to her, which we can do this to our prospects. And it's not like something that we do in marketing and sales. It's an authenticity. It's like, no, this is just how we operate because we're humans that value humans. I'm not true. just running a play to get them to feel good about themselves so that they can yeah. X, Y, Z. It's like, no, I genuinely want to help them. So I run this play because it helps them open up so I can get the real answers so I can actually help them. That's right. right. All right, man. I want to know of a good like book or business resource that you found. You kind of already mentioned Cardone, you as well as Ryan's sales training. Anything else that you'd recommend that the listeners grab? Yeah, sure. I've got a guide right now that listeners can grab. That's you know Love since it. you since you offered. Yeah, it's how to create content that actually creates cash. Um, there's a simple step by step guide that you know I just I just pounded business owners and said, dude, you got to get in front of the camera. The next question is. What do I say? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, like, okay, what do I do? Not a problem. All right. Not a problem. Okay. Now what do I do? Right? Yeah. This, this yeah. is where they freeze. They, they put the camera, they see their face and they go, okay, what uh -oh. do I say? So I, I created a guide that, that could be really helpful to anybody that's watching this. So what I'll say is if you want this guide, it's absolutely free. I promise not to ask you to have sex. I promise <laughs> we'll go on a date. But it's, it's just free value. And I like building this community. So whether you're a million dollar business or you're just starting out, just yeah. Instagram me the word guide, G-U-I-D-E. Just Perfect. DM me the word guide at about buck and I'll get you that guide. It's by the way, it's fresh. Like we just launched this thing last week Love and it. I spent a ton, ton, ton of time on it. I actually was only going to spend a short amount of time on it, but my second resource, so I won't be so self, self-indulging here, was Hermosi's new book, $100 million offer. It's yeah. such a great book and yeah. it talks about how entrepreneurs rush the product to market too fast. Yeah. And so I slowed down on the guide. I took my time and I built something that I could truly be proud of. So I yeah. know that this, you know, my intent was this thing actually needs to help owners create content that drives yeah. real results in revenue. Yeah, so that's, great. that's, that's exactly what I did, but that's another great read. Yeah. You know, my audible is just filled with yeah. amazing books. I could go on and on You're and on. There's finance books and Oh, one of my other favorite ones that's really good for business. You know, it's interesting because you, you, people see me and they talk a lot about marketing. 
Sure. There's a lot of operations inside marketing that That's makes right. marketing more successful. So Dan Marsh Martell, buy back your time. Have you heard of that one? I've just only heard of it probably from another guest a couple of weeks ago, but I have not yet read it. Hands down. If you feel swamped right now in your business. Yeah. If you feel swamped and you're just like, I need to be doing this to grow the business, but I'm stuck in the business. That's the book you want to read. Buy back your time. A real understanding of, it. of how time really is more valuable than money. And yep. so I'd say that's another great one. Yeah, great leverage point. Definitely appreciate the opportunity to grab your guide. We'll put that information in the show notes below. So definitely Sweet. if you're listening right now, you want that, check Buck out on Instagram. Thank follow you, man. the show notes. Appreciate um, that. I got a question for you about family and then we'll wrap this thing up. Yep. We both know the word obsession. We worked for a guy that was pretty obsessed and I'm all about it. I love obsession. I, I am yeah. obsessed. You are obsessed. Yeah. And, and entrepreneurs are obsessed with their business, but I want to know how you've been obsessed with your family at the same time as doing all these incredible things in business. Yeah, yeah sure. By the way, I was not as obsessed before I worked in the Grand okay. Cardone Network as I am okay. now. Okay. I give him so much kudos for sort of, you know, look, 20 years of corporate life and he was right. like, let's go fast. And I was like, Oof, yeah. this guy is a bitch. <laughs> he yeah. taught me to step my game up. I think the biggest thing he taught me was accountability. You know, it's just so the, easy to slip into complacency and point fingers in other places. Yep. You know, so you can look at like, sure, there's Leaders Eat Last and a lot of other great leadership books on this, but sure. But like he really teaches accountability. And, and so one of those things is family. Family and accountability are big to me. Yep. I honestly, now more than ever, I'm more focused. My kids are at that perfect age. I've got, let's see, five, eight, no, five, seven, and nine. That's what I got. Nice. Five, Love seven, it. and nine. And they're in the prime, man. Like totally. dance class, soccer yep. games, yep. baseball, football, theater class. Nice. So I'm really big on that being my purpose. My legacy is to show my kids how to create their own success. I think the challenges were taught and brought up in a world where you have to go to college and you have to get a corporate career, good job with a steady 401k. And I want to teach my kids to be self-starters and create their own, their, their own legacy. Yeah. And, you know, so my nine-year-old has a dog business. He made like $2,000 last summer walking Love dogs it. in the condo out here in Arizona. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, at nine, I wasn't making a thousand dollars, you know? Nope. Uh, not at all. I was in summer camp goofing off. So that's right. That's right. That's yeah. That's kind of my thing. You know, I, I, I'm big on family and spending more time with them. A lot of the reasons I went off to start my own agency was because, you know, that 10 X network is such a grind. You don't always have time for that's right. personal and family. I would never take back my time there because yeah. I wouldn't be as successful today with my business had I not done three years there. But oh, yeah. I knew it was time to build my own thing and yep. spend more time with family at the same time. Yeah, understood. I love that. Last question here for you, Buck. If you could reach back into time, whisper to the younger Buck, what yeah. would you tell him? That's a good question. I uh, normally, I would probably say start a business sooner because I was an accidental entrepreneur. Yeah. I did not want to start a business. I literally had a client dump cash in my lap. Yeah. Come take and, it. And, and by the way, I do not think, I do not think. So if you're young right now, I don't know, this is kind of anti Gary B maybe, but I do not think if you're young, you should start your own business. I just don't. I think okay. you should be in the corporate space. You should experience another startup. You, yeah. There's perspective. Take somebody else's money to fail. Yeah. Before you start your own, you go start your own business at 18 years old. Very rare. Now I, I've seen, I got a landscaping business. I used to work with these twin brothers were 18 and 19 years old. They did like $4 million one year, just landscape, right? Pure, pure need, you know, in the marketplace. And they were yep. just there and hustled hard to just hustle. It. Yep. Yeah. So I'm not saying you can't, but I would say consider spending years in the craft and use someone else's dollars to craft in what you are, how you do it, how they do it, following those footsteps. So, but I did it for 20 years. I think I could have done it for 15. Sure. So I probably, you, you know, that's the thing. Most people don't have the balls. It's scary. The liability yep. falls on you that's to right. go out and be an entrepreneur. And that's why, 
you know, it's a risk reward thing. The reward is massive, but so is the risk. Yeah. And some people get eaten for lunch on the risk side. So I get it. People are afraid to do it. But I would say, you know, probably, probably bail out sooner. But yeah. it's hard to say that, man, because had I bailed out sooner, I wouldn't have had three years at the 10X network, right. you know? Yeah. So, so I went straight from agency life. I was working at the world's largest agency with 40,000 employees, WPP. Wow. It was agency was called Wonderman Thompson, JWT and Wonderman. We brought them both together, two massive agencies. And, and so I went straight from there to Cardone, but I knew like it, it was oh, my yeah. time to start something. Totally. You know? Yep. I received that buck. You've given us your Instagram. Any other ways that we can reach you or that you want to direct us to? Obviously, if they're a business owner over a million, they yeah. can apply to work with you. That's if right. they're not, they can get your guide and start creating content. Anything they else? They both as far should as get the guide. People? Everybody they should, should both get, get the yeah, guide. That's right. <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Start creating content that actually drives cash and revenue. But no, Instagram's the best for me. Literally, my mom will text me. I don't answer. I'm like, mom, Instagram me. I'm faster on DM, you know? I love it. Yeah. Love it. Good stuff, Thanks man. for well, having me on, man. This is yeah. this is a great podcast. I love what you're doing to help entrepreneurs. This is really cool. I appreciate you being here. You gave so much value here today, and I just the reignition of of just us. I'm floored that we had this time together, and, and I'll take this energy and apply it to good stuff here this week myself. So thanks nice, for giving bro. out to the listeners. Blessings to you and your family, your kiddos, all that you're touching here in 2023. Thanks for being here. Thank bro. you, bro. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.